Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to another Record Live. We are so sorry we had some technical difficulties, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we just really had some issues with the internet, so we're uploading this a little bit later. We're recording the conversation, so unfortunately that means that your comments and things, we can't interact with them live, but if you're watching this in the future and you would like to make a comment or have a question for either um, Darren or Terry or anyone here, um, do let us know and we'll try and get back to them um, in the next few hours or couple of days or so. But uh, we are here, we finally made it, and I just wanted to extend a big welcome to Darren Garlett and um, Terry. Now, let me see if I can get your, no, I'm just going to pronounce your last name, Terry Casares. So thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. It's a privilege. Welcome. Um, so we might start with you, Terry. Would you just like to introduce yourself, a bit about what you do, your family, and um, yeah. Okay, well, um, I'm originally from the Northern Territory, but I've, it's, been a real, uh, it's been a great privilege that I've been living and working on Wadjuk country in the southwest of Western Australia, um, so Perth. And um, I have two sons and a daughter. They're, they're adults. Um, I've been an, I've been involved in Aboriginal education for over 30 years and um, most of that time, well at least 20 years, have been um, teaching in, um, in a university context. Mm. Wow. So um, what is your research or teaching sort of um, involve? What's your topic of interest? Well, um, I guess broadly speaking, uh, racism, yeah. but, but um, with, with teach, I'm mostly involved with, with um, lecturing to teacher education students and, um, and it's about developing cultural competency so that... Um, you know, when teachers are in the classroom, whether it is with, with Aboriginal students or with non-Aboriginal students, that, um, that they are always mindful of the power that they have as teachers to make a difference. Mm. And, um, and so, that, so that teachers don't inadvertently make mistakes. Nobody decides that they want to say, well, very few anyway, that they want, oh, I'll just, you know, say some racist things. Or it's, it's what's invisible, it's what's, it's what's hidden, it's what we don't realise um, that we try to make um, known so that, um, so that students aren't disadvantaged educationally. Mm very very important the work you're doing and um yeah we look forward to learning a lot from you today i'm sure but before we um, learn more about your story um darren would you just like to introduce yourself and um what you do oh what do i do um my name is darren garlett um my wife kathy we've got four children i'm currently the adsim director for the australian union conference enjoying my role there and uh church ministry for oh a number of conferences I've worked in. So, yeah, we've had a good run with uh, working for the church and in enjoying it still. Great. So, um, ATSIM, do you want to just explain a little bit about what that is for people who don't know? Yeah, ATSIM is uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Ministries. Uh, it's a department of the uh, Union, Australian Union Conference. And so we have women's ministry, we have... Uh, uh, youth ministry and resource centre and ministerial and so ATSIM is a department of the union mm -hmm. and what we do at ATSIM is we coordinate the Indigenous work or the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander work all over Australia and we work with the local conferences um, and develop resources and yeah really try and keep a handle on where our ministry is heading so mm. awesome it's really great to have you guys on today. Um, we, the reason we got you on is because around the world there's this um, 
real um, movement, Black Lives Matter movement is happening and we're seeing it all over our news um, news feeds at the moment. Uh, but Black Lives Matter seems to be resonating with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in, in Australia, in our own context. And so we wanted to get some of that context uh, from from both of you uh, today and to, to have a conversation framed around some of those issues in Australia, in an Australian context, racism, inequality, um, and how the church, the Adventist church, fits into that space as well. So maybe to start off, if we can just contextualise this conversation for those who are watching this, um, why has Black Lives Matter resonated so much with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, along with many other people in Australia? First, I'll, I'll speak to this firstly, if you like. Um, a, a big acknowledgement to Adventist Record, to you guys being willing to have a chat about a very, very sensitive topic for a lot of people. It's a challenging topic as well. Mm. And, and, I, and I guess what is needed is, is more time to uh, just have that conversation, try and get an understanding. And so what we're doing today is really helpful for that. And I hope that our listeners will uh, get a sense of uh, greater understanding from our, our, our discussion today. Mm. Mm, yes. I, I guess what's, what resonates so much for the Indigenous people here in Australia is, um, and I haven't, I haven't seen the video of what happened to the police officer. I've chosen not to. Um, from the right from the get go, um, I know the outcome, and yes. but for for a lot of our our people, uh, I guess that sense of hurt, that sense of pain, that a lot of people in a, in in the US is feeling, resonates with them because they feel that here too. Uh, Australia is no different. Uh, the amount of people that die at the at the hands of uh, the police, the justice system, um, in the prisons and so on. Uh, it affects a lot of the communities, a lot of the people in the communities, our families and so on. And so when we see things like that happening, it's, it's not unique to America, but it's something that, that is close to home for us in this country. Mm -hmm. And I think it's 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 just so important that um, that you support traumatized communities rather than um, you know leave them to suffer alone. International support really does make a big difference because often governments can um, can choose to ignore what the domestic voice is saying. But when there is international support, it really does make a difference. I can remember um, a, a colleague of mine um, during the, the Holocaust years, he said that it was Australian Aboriginal people who, who went to the German um, um, embassy here in Australia and they handed a letter and said, we protest what we are we want to protest what's happening to our jewish brothers and sisters and they said as far as they know that it was you know we were one of those few voices that that spoke up and i think it's just incredibly important to speak up and not sit in silence when you see when you see suffering and like darren i can't bring myself to watch that video but i but i you know, the news happened to be on while I was watching last night and I, and I saw the funeral. And you relive what has happened, what we go through so many times before. And so um, showing, showing that support for brothers and sisters and, um, and, and also remembering that, that this is also a global phenomena. It, as Darren says, it's not isolated. I think it's interesting that you both um, mentioned not watching the video. I haven't watched that video either. And I, 
I think it's something that a lot of people can relate to because it's, you know, it's, it's, we know the outcome, as Darren said, it's a traumatic sort of thing to, to, to see. Um, and yet it's important not to let it just pass, pass by and, and just to let it happen without acknowledging it. And, and can you tell me a little bit, if you're comfortable about why, uh, what some of that process, you touched on it a little bit, Terry, but the idea of, how things like this video and and the other things that have come out of the states recently how that would affect an um aboriginal and torres strait islander person how would that affect them hearing stories like this on a on a personal level at a at a personal level it can be traumatic um because it's all too familiar um um, we, we, and it, look, it may not be black deaths in custody, but um, it is, it's just um, endless funerals that we attend. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, because, you know, our country has got um, such, such a history and quite often it, it's hidden to, to so many Australians. Um, and when you, when you start delving into Australian history, so historians, for instance, like Henry Reynolds, who has written so many books um, on, on Australian history as it affects Aboriginal people, and he said that he was not prepared for the level of violence that he uncovered as he started to get into the archives. Um, It was totally um, unprepared. Yeah. Wow. And And I guess, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No. I guess studies show now we're learning more about trauma and how it gets passed on through genetics, through families. Um, And so some of those traumas of the past haven't been sort of just forgotten and, and left in the past. People are carrying these things around in their bodies, in, in their uh, genetic makeup, in, in, inside themselves. Oh, um, absolutely. And it isn't, it, it wasn't just that first wave of, of um, colonialism either, where it was frontier mentality and where massacres where are occurring. There's, there is a, um, um, there's a, a map that's available on the internet now. It's a map of the, the massacres that have occurred around Australia. And I, I, I must admit, even I, even I when, and I'm familiar with, um, with, 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 what Henry Reynolds has um, has has written with Bill Will with enough of what he has written about, and it's 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 a bit of a worry. It really is a wake up call when we start to see our history becoming more visible, and um, you know, there in black and white, in front of our faces. Um, so yes, it, it's a history that is becoming more and more visible. Mm. I guess this issue, if you want to label it as such, is um, obviously playing out in an Australian global context, first of all, and then also in an Australian context, but then also in a church context. And it's difficult. I know, um, for instance, you know, the Australian government has um, been implementing this closing the gap initiative for many years. And it's, I guess, been successful to some extent, but not successful to other extents. When it comes to the sort of injustice and the separation and the inequality that exists between white and Indigenous Australians, what what does that actually look like? What is the desired outcome of something like this on like that broad scale? Because is it sort of, you know, being... um, (laughs) it's so difficult to even like understand this for me personally as like a white Australian, right? Mm -hmm. So is it to be sort of um, in white culture or is it to have the same recognition that you deserve, you know, with like the land rights and everything? Like what does it actually look like, if that makes sense? 
Um, it's probably going to be more helpful if, if we try to unpack it a little bit more um, and in understanding our understanding of what racism is. Um, mm -hmm. if, yeah. So, so many, um, there's a general understanding that, that, that racism occurs by, by mean people they are one-off events, that they're random, um, and it's just those few bad apples in, in society that make the rest of us, us look bad. Mm -hmm. And racism is embedded in a society. Racism is, is, is it's structural. Mm -hmm. And so often um, the people have that can behave in ways that hurt fellow indigenous australians without even realizing it mm -hmm. and that's the scary nature of it mm -hmm. um yes there's uh, unfortunately you know we've there is more value that is 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 placed on um human beings if you've got a white skin. There's been a lot written about this. And, um, you know, there are, there's, there's, there's a whole branch of studies. It's called whiteness studies. And it, it's just about um, um, an, an ideology of, it, it, it actually comes from evolution. It comes from social Darwinism. And, um, and Aboriginal people were this missing link, you know, so it, it, in our very early, in our very early history, um, that's why you'll find Aboriginal bones in museums, um, you know, around the world, you'll find Aboriginal skulls and Aboriginal people have, have had to, you know, have, um, make, um, you know, try to get that, make those efforts to bring human the human remains home, mm. because we were the subject of scientific investigation to prove that link. So the thing is, if you can prove if if, if you can prove that people are closer to being animals than being human, then you can justify that kind of violence that did occur, and and um, and. When you institute policies, which we which we did have policies of yeah. segregation and seg and separation, mm -hmm. and when you segregate people into areas where you where you restrict their access to services, when you where you restrict their access to good quality water, even you know, where we're not yeah. we're not talking about whether there's a doctor there, but where they where the drinking water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is, um, is 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 at a good level, you know. So the um, it it builds up quite um, it builds a picture of kind of um, if racism doesn't occur. Well, well, I won't say racism. If if discrimination doesn't occur, you're wondering. Well, that's a surprise because. It's so, uh, you know, the default position is that Aboriginal people have, uh, in particular, now I'm, I know that there are other groups that are, are also disadvantaged and discriminated against, but um, we suffer the worst health. You know? Unfortunately, our, our incarceration rates are the highest. We're only 3%. And mm. yet, um, at one point, I think Aboriginal youth were 28 times um, more at risk of incarceration than um, the non-indigenous youths, the non-indigenous youth rather. And so you set the, a pipeline is established fairly early on, where youth go from school straight into prison. I mean, there are things like the like like police move on laws, where Aboriginal people become criminalised. They move straight into the criminal justice system through things like, you know, being asked to move on, and then if you don't move on, then the police can, um, you know, arrest you. 
where people come into town, they come into town to visit family in, in, in the hospital. Um, and when I say town, come in from remote areas. Um, and yeah. before they know it, they've, they've um, been in court. And, and then you've got situations where, where um, with the non-payment of fines, people are in the um, criminal justice system. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about something here that is extremely um, wide reaching mm. and, 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 and complex and entrenched. I think it's horrific just to pick up on something you said, Terry, that your expectation of discrimination is the norm, that it's not sort of a surprise, a surprise to experience that. Um, that's, that's horrific to me to just think about that as a person who probably doesn't get much discrimination in my life. Well, you know, if I give you, sorry, Darren, I'll just, um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm, you will have so many examples, but Recently, because of the coronavirus, I heard of um, a white person in the church who, who was, he was going for a walk in the street and the police stopped him and said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just going for a nature walk. And they were cautioned and, they, and the police um, said, well, you know that you are risking a fine. Um, I, uh, you know, um, because there's, um, you should be trying to stay at home as much as possible or, or mm. exercising. Yes. And, and I thought, wow, that's happening to a white person? No <laughs> way. Huh? Because we have to educate our kids mm. about the things to avoid so that you don't, so that you try to avoid the radar. Mm. Mm. And I'm not saying that people do this deliberately. It's because there's... Um, Look, I won't get into that right now. I'll, I'll, you know, Darren may want to jump in and, and add some add some things here. But um, yeah, you, you've got to teach your kids mm. how to stay safe. I think um, Terry will probably get more into that education towards the end when we're looking at kind of practical steps. And you'll have a wealth of knowledge, I'm sure. But one thing you were sort of mentioning as you were talking was. Um, I think to sum it up, you know, there's this ideology in especially Western society where um, this kind of like white supremacist sort of an ideology. And then that leads to this institutionalization of this um, racism, I suppose. But Darren, I just want to um, ask you, so, you know, the church, <laughs> that's an institution and there's a lot of layers and levels. How do you see racism institutionalized in the Adventist church? That's a good question. Um, from where I mean, I've been through all the stages of church working, um, you know, coming in as a brand new Adventist, being the only Adventist in my family. So getting to know Advent Adventism was fairly, um, yeah, interesting from the beginning. And uh, I, I guess for us, we, uh, we observed a, a lot of things that are happening um, around us. There are tensions in churches where... Aboriginal people uh, were meeting in the Adventist church in, in some of our local churches. There are places where, where we've got Aboriginal people who would not go to church, to an Adventist church, because they felt that it was uh, either racist or there was members in there that were uh, racist towards them or to their children. Um, then as... As a church leader, uh, we, we try and work through some of those issues. Um, then, like I, I, I work for the union today, and do we have a, a racism in the church today? Well, it's there's some of it that's still there on on the grassroots level. Yes, mm. but also there's I wouldn't call it racism as such, but there's an ignorance. There is a lack of knowledge. There's a lack of understanding about Indigenous issues. And we've got people that, um, you know, we, we all work for the church, my colleagues and stuff. 
but we 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 specialize in our areas and and what we think may should or should be common knowledge to others may not be and so there's a little bit of you know unknown there uncertainty so mm. when you don't know what to do or what to say so you don't do anything and um and while it's not classified as racism but it is a neglect to do something about you know an issue but you know we we have there's there's one church um well, there's one town that we have two churches in today where there's an Aboriginal church and there's a non-Aboriginal church. Uh, I was fortunate to be the pastor at, at that particular town. I was the uh, first Indigenous pastor to be the pastor of the two of those churches at the same time. Mm. And while it, it had, a, had its challenges, beautiful families in both churches, but the history of the town and the history of our country prevents that those two churches from coming together mm. uh, even to this day so um, so we do have some challenges we also even we face challenges from atsim because we have non-aboriginal people who will say to us why are we being separate why are we right. you know segregating ourselves why do we have a special privileges or special department mm. um, and it's taken a long time for for Atsim to be established uh, over many years, and and it hasn't been an easy process. Along the way, it had its challenges all, all the way. Um, yeah. So so, are we there as a church? No, we're not there. Are we moving towards that? We absolutely are, and. And we're, we're making really good results. And, and as time goes or moves forward, uh, we, we're seeing a greater understanding uh, from our church members, from our leaders. And we, we do have a lot of support from our church, which has helped the progress to where ATSIM is today. Mm. Yeah. Darren, I just wanted to give you the opportunity as well to sort of whether you've experienced, I guess, on a personal level, some racism or or discrimination, perhaps, um, as Trey, um, Terry said, use the term discrimination in 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 the church. You know, you've you've you've, as you said, you joined the church. You wanted to um, obviously become a pastor, or you've been a leader in the church now, and you're right at the at the at the union level now. Um, and so you've you've seen all levels of the church, but I, I guess. <laughs> Rather than necessarily specific examples, you can give some words, but I guess how, how, how you felt as an Aboriginal man at times when you've come against some of this opposition or some, some of these difficult situations has, and how your faith has fared in those circumstances. Because I'd imagine you'd question uh, coming against some of these challenges. You'd even question your, I guess, commitment mm. to the church or, or why, why am I doing this? Why am I in this group of That's people? Right. If, um, can you just, just give us, just so we can put a face onto that, if yeah. you're comfortable into that situation. Yeah, go, going right back to probably my first encounter with, with racism was probably when I was 11 years of age in primary school. Mm. Started mm. at a new primary school and uh, I turned up there and... Recess and lunchtime constantly for the first, I think it was first three weeks at least, where we were dealing with racism in the playground. Um, so, you know, boom, nigger, all those words. And, and it wasn't just, just the Aboriginal kids in the school. We had the Italian kids and, you know, they were being called names as well. Um, so the, the local cricket nets was the place to go to sort of sort all that out <laughs> during lunch and recess. And, um, but, but you become attuned then to what, what racism is. Mm. And so from that point on, you're walking through society and it, you're, the radar, you know, is going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and some might say, well, you're oversensitive. Well, you know what it is. And so you pick it up very easily what racism is. Mm. And it's not that you're looking out for it, but you know it when you see it. And um, from that point on, just going through 
through life in general and, and then working for the church. Um, yeah, you get, to, you get to see things happening that, um, you know, you, you question it, you struggle with it. My, 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 my challenge that I have is do I stand up for it? I'm not, I'm not a person that stands to um, take on things that I don't need to take on. And I always say to myself, well, if I, wanted to, if I wanted to stand up and fight for things, I would have become a politician or do something or an right, activist yeah. or something like that. Choose my battles. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I constantly remind myself, this is God's work. It always has been God's work. And any of the challenges that we come across in the church, I always see it as this is God's work that he needs to work through because I'm his people, they are his people, and somehow he's got to work with both of us for the for the good and to achieve his directive. So, mm. yeah, so I constantly remind myself of that. But uh, it, are there times where you would just want to throw your hands up and walk away? Absolutely. I think, you know, any any minister would say that because there's so many different challenges that come your way. And, um, and especially when you're, you know, when... Um, when you're dealing with stuff with the community, that there's racial tensions in the community outside of the church, um, that becomes a difficult area to, to navigate and to work through whilst you're trying to lead a, a church, a mainstream mm-hmm. church, through the process of understanding as well. So yes. it takes a lot of patience and yeah, courage there. It has its moments. And, and Terry, as a church member... I guess someone who's has an association with the church. How 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 do you navigate with your faith and and some of the discrimination or the the racism that you um, encounter in your day to day life? As Darren says, there's um, we've made progress. I mean, I think we've got a way to go. Yes. Um, well, I don't think that. I know that we have a way to go. However, mm. I can remember an incident. In, I think this is in the 80s, I won't say where, but um, I'm in Sabbath school with my mother and, um, and my kids. And someone makes the, as part of the Sabbath school discussion, someone makes the comment, um, now I can really understand the love of Jesus because if Jesus can love Aboriginal people, then... That's love. And my mother and I were both shocked. We, we were stunned. We didn't know what to say. Mm. I just, I couldn't believe it. Mm. It just so happened that on that particular day, there was the, the director of the conference visiting. And so I thought that I would go and have a yarn with him afterwards. And so I went I shared with this because I, I, was, I was really upset. Yeah. And unfortunately, the salt was rubbed into the wounds because the response was, we all have our crosses to bear. And so from, from that point, I, I would... Church became an unsafe place. It wasn't the only comment. Having... having mm. um, having lunches, you know, having basket lunches, and you'd try to, you didn't want to go near that were, you know, the Aboriginal conversation because everybody had um, their, um, their opinion hmm. about Aboriginal people, even when they were trying to be helpful. Hmm. Right? And, um, and so... I would always sit at the back of the church. I would go late. I would sit at the back of the church and I would try and leave early. I would just try to get a message and then get out of there as quickly as I could. And it remained like that for a while. Um, And then probably in the last 10 years, um, I've, you know, we had an experience where I, my sister came with me. Um, anyway, it was a church that I, I went to, and I was, I was like, wow. And it was here in, here in Perth. 
and um, and I was associated with that church for quite a while. And and there were, you know, there was a particular family there who would watch out if if they saw Aboriginal people arrive and make sure that they went and welcomed us. You know? mm. I mean, I heard mm. about that. I heard about that later. We I invited my sister down to um, a church camp. And she went to the Friday night meeting and she came out upset. She heard the way that, you know, there were comments. She heard comments being made about Aboriginal people. And once again, this same family said, that's not on. You know, that's outrageous. There is no way that you should have been, been um, subjected to that. There is no place in the church for this. And um, we need to do something about this. Mm. So that... You know, on the whole, it wasn't happening. And then when it did happen, it was dealt with decisively. You know, that made all the difference. It made all the difference to my sister and it mm -hmm. made all the difference to me. Um, and so it's been, um, it's, it's, it's a safer environment now. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, we've still got a long way to go. Mm. And I guess leading on from that, for both Darren and, and Terry, um, I guess what we always try and do on these these record lives, you've given us a good context and some more of that context, I think, will come out in the rest of our conversation. But one thing that we really like to, to have as important, and I think it's valuable in this in this time as well, in this conversation, is the practical elements of, 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 of both living this and then what we can do. Those who are watching who may not be Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, um, but also um, the church members as Aboriginal church members, as corporate um, church structures and institutions, and as the ATSIM ministries themselves, some of those different areas. We'll start with um, maybe individuals. What can individuals do? Um, you've given us an example in, in that anecdote of a family who really made Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people feel welcome in the church. Um, what what can we as individuals start to do to address some of this, um, the racism and the systems of discrimination that have been set up, um, both in the church and outside the church, in our, in our communities? What do we need to be aware of and what do we need to do? I think the, one of the first things for, for our church members to understand is the history of our country. And whilst there may be, a, you know, some that might say, well, well, that's in the past now and we need to move on from that. The history of Australia and for its Aboriginal people is, is it's not that old. Um, we're talking about things that impacted our parents, uh, our grandparents. Like my, my parents, my grandparents, they, they grew up on reserves outside of town because they weren't allowed in town. Um, you know, that's, that's just my family. Um, so we're not going back generations to, uh, you know, to ancestors or uh, to, to the, you know, first settlement and things like that. This is recent stuff. And I think understanding that, that the impacts and, and the, the things that have been going on in this country is very recent. And so if we understand a little bit of that, then we know what's really going on in our community. Why are... When we, when we turn our TVs on, we see Aboriginal people that are upset or they've got this stereotype that they're angry people and things like that. They're upset because these things, you know, happened very recently and it's to their parents or their grandparents and, and they are impacted by that. So understanding that, I think, is that, that's probably the first thing I would say, understanding mm. our history. That's a common theme with um, the Black Lives Matter movement as well. I've seen on social media a lot of African-American people who sort of lament the fact that they have to, as white people, sometimes we expect them to educate us. But there's books, there's resources, there's histories that are available that we could do the work ourselves, but sometimes we're just lazy to do that. We, we, we expect um, to go to the... Yeah, an indigenous person we know or, or, or the African-American person we know and we say, hey, explain this to us. What, what, are you guys, what are you guys angry about? But that can be quite draining when you have to 
I imagine go through that every day of your life and, and explain it to every every person that comes and wants you to be their sort of textbook. So true. I mean, you know, and, and look, we, we love sharing our culture. We love sharing um, our stories and things like that. I mean, that's that's part of our culture is sitting down. If you've got a campfire, even better and sharing yep. stories. <laughs> um and you know so so there's the we enjoy doing that um yes. there's got to be an element of understanding and being receptive to that there's if you know, and and the thing is australian people they can they can read you know uh, Ab- i'm sorry aboriginal people they can they'll read people and what mm-hmm. i mean by that is um sitting face-to-face talking, they will pick up on the body language of that person more than anything else. You can say wow. whatever you like. You can use all the words you like, mm-hmm. but they will read the body language and that's the message that they'll take away. Right. Um, so there's got to be a willingness to, to come and to, to learn rather than come with your own ideas and, and your own answers and your reasons why. So... Mm-hmm. That's, that's another point that I'd make. Um, Terry, you want to add another one? I think that our education, um, our education, our institutions have a big part to play, particularly at education. Mm-hmm. And um, to, I, I think, be serious, because we're not talking about Aboriginal history here, because Aboriginal people did not come up with those policies. It's about taking responsibility for the things that, that we're responsible for. And, and if you are part of dominant society, then you have benefited from that unlevel playing field. And we are only 3% of the population. This is the time where, if ever there was a time for, um, you know, the dominant group to begin to take a serious interest in um, the things that have been taken for granted. Um, and also, yes, yeah, so our education system in particular. The other thing is there is such a direct relationship between, between racism and health. Mm-hmm. And the, the um, David, Professor David Williams, he's an Adventist man, he's a black American, he's of mm-hmm. a Caribbean background, mm-hmm. uh, he's at Harvard. Uni. Now, he developed a, um, um, a, a means of measuring racism. And he was able to then, though, though, you know, and, and, and there's work, you know, there are Indigenous academics in this country, people like Professor Ian Paradis. They make that connection between racism and health. And wow. It robs people's lives. Well, you, you know, you think about it. If you are living in a state of, of anxiety because you don't know um, when the next hit may come, um, then think about what that does to your blood pressure. Mm. Think yes. about what raised levels of blood pressure does to your body constantly. And that's only the beginning. Then you've got because of because of segregated living spaces, you don't have that same access to to um, medical facilities. Um, you don't have that same access to a good income. Uh, I, I mean, uh, education even because having good incomes is reliant upon having good education. If you don't have those things, then it all it all adds up to poor health. 
how do you afford the things that um, that are taken for granted by, by the rest of Australia? And uh, so the first thing I think is education, and I think that we we do have, we, we've had campaigns like um, domestic violence. The church has has really taken us, um, you know, is doing the right thing when it has come to institutional control of this. Um, and I think that educating our, our membership, you know, health is, is, is a cornerstone. This is one of the things that Adventists yes. um, are known for. Mm. If you leave racism, if, if you leave out, how do we discriminate inadvertently? If you leave that out, of um, out of the the health equation, then people continue to suffer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we haven't even started to to mention yet the stolen generations. On there's we've had over seventy years, almost one hundred years, in this in this country of of generation after generation of children being being. Um, being removed from their families, you think about the communal, the 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 the, um, the intergenerational trauma, mm -hmm. um, and also the um, we one of the links that we will put up there is is a 2016 um, presentation by David Williams. It's an excellent presentation. It's only about, it, he was talking at a conference and it, it's a conference for purpose-built communities mm -hmm. um, because you've got to have a holistic approach to addressing this problem you know, where we treat each other differentially based upon our looks and the colour of our skin. Mm -hmm. And and. I just have to slip this in. I don't want people to get the idea either that that fair skin Aboriginal people are any better off. They're not, because fair skin Aboriginal people are part of families that have dark skin Aboriginal people, and the fair skin Aboriginal people have suffered exactly the same kind of history and abuse and discrimination. And then on top of it, what they get is, oh, but you don't look Aboriginal. No? Um, oh. Right. Um, it's you know where your identity is in question. But anyway, I don't want to get mm. I, I, I don't want to get off the track of this presentation. In this presentation, David Williams puts up some stats and he compares. Mind you, the study was done in two thousand and four. It was done some time ago. I think by people. It was I think it was Bramley at all. But um, in his two thousand and sixteen presentation, he compares the, the um, mortality rates of Indigenous people in, in, in well-off countries like the US, Australia, New Zealand, Canada. Mm -hmm. And in Canada, New Zealand and the US, there was a seven-year age gap, um, sorry, a seven-year mortality gap mm -hmm. where Aboriginal people um, died seven years earlier. For Aboriginal people at that time, it was 21 years earlier. Wow. For Australia. So the Australian stats were, were off the, off the, you know. Um, three times worse. Three times worse, not double, three times worse. I think now we're down to twice as worse. I think our, our, the, the the, and this is why people want to know what is this closing the gap all about. This is why. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think we're down to it's about around eight years. We live yep. about eight years less. And I think in the other countries that they've got it down to about four. Um, and so it's it um, it really is uh, a, an extremely serious problem. Mm. I have heard. I to... Sorry. Sorry. Oh, no, I just wanted to bring it back to. So, education and also in terms of health, there are things that we can do. Yeah. Absolutely. I have heard in the past, actually, that 
Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders are the worst treated based on sort of socioeconomic status and also the history of everything that's happened compared to all the other Indigenous nations around the world. Is that correct or is that just something I've heard? Look, I think that I, I think our, our um, policies have been particularly harsh mm -hmm. and it's been a heavy handed, a very heavy handed approach. And um, because we haven't had a treaty, mm. there's been no treaty, and um, and I and I believe every other country has. You know, so that's been that has meant that we've um, been able to be um, um, treated as if we have no rights. Yeah. In fact, when I was born, um, I, I was part of the Flora and Fauna Act. The, mm. uh, I was not a, um, a, a, you know, counted as a citizen of this country. I, I had no citizen citizenship rights. Mm. And so, yes, the, the issue of the treaty, uh, you know, just having, you've got to have things in your political system that, that do... Um, that do provide for the rights of your citizenry. And I think it's important for, for church people to understand that rather than thinking that we are, you know, on, you know, constantly looking for charity. You know, there are very good reasons why Aboriginal people are in the situation that we are in. Mm -hmm. um, and look, on, look, I think at an individual level, there are things that, we could, you know, people can do like, even um, you know, getting involved in mission work here in Australia rather than only mission work that is, it's only real mission work if you go um, overseas. Now, I'm, I absolutely support overseas mission work. Um, no question about that. And um, incredibly important um, and vital. Mm. Um, but, but not being afraid to put your hand up. Uh, the other thing is 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 supporting with, with tithes and offerings with um, like for instance I think of Mamarafa College who exists on a, yes. you know, the institution exists on a shoestring budget the mm. people that work there they you know do the job of um, you know three people each person doing the job of three people um, mm. you know the the the, um, the AUC and and, and Andra, Adra um, support to the best of their their abilities, mm -hmm. and um, well, probably yeah. But um, you know, there, 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 there's those kinds of individual ways that people can become involved, um, mm -hmm. be informed, and become become champions, become allies mm -hmm. of Aboriginal people, become champions amongst your amongst your own mob, mm -hmm. in terms of speaking up when you hear something don't let it go stand up and say i can't agree with you or, or question why did you say that um don't just allow the status quo to remain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. comments yeah they say and that, um i was just gonna say they say that uh, silence is siding with the oppressor and i think that's um yeah very good to keep in mind to actually speak up about it but anyway sorry jared <laughs> yes I was just going to say Mamarafa College has an offering coming up in, in August. Um, every two years they get an offering for the AC and, and yeah, that'll be important, um, especially at this time when offerings are so down because of COVID-19. Mamarafa is really going to need some support in that offering. Um, did we work out when, when that date exactly was, Darren? I think the 22nd or the 29th? I think it's... Uh, oh. No, I don't have it in front of me here. Yeah. That's right. We'll we'll we'll, um, okay. we'll work it out it. and put yeah. it up. But yeah, Mamarafa throughout August, probably even now, you can go onto the e giving app and find Mamarafa College as a as a cause for the AUC offering this year, um, and and support them because yeah, they're doing some amazing work. Um, and while we're talking about Mamarafa, we've thank you Terry for some of those tips. You know, um, there's a lot of talk about becoming an ally and 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 supporting people and not being silent when when things happen um but darren if we could go to you just a little bit on in terms of what atsim is doing and and perhaps some other ways that other church members could support atsim 
um, in a practical sense. Uh, we are running, we're conscious of your time. We don't want to take up too much more of it. We've, we've chatted for a while, but um, yeah, at Sim, what, what can I, I we do to support it? I think it's important for our audience. You know, our audience is our, our church members and we, we value them greatly and um, we, we love, you know, their feedback and things like that. Um, I, I think it's really important for our, our church to, to know that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Ministries Department of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is probably the leading Indigenous church ministry group in Australia. Mm. Adventists don't realise that, but we're the only church that coordinates a national work. There are all other church groups doing different things all over the place, but they are not nationally co coordinated. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been the strength of our ministry, is having a national coordination. We have conferences on the ground. We have Bible workers and ministers um, doing a fantastic job, and, and we're, we're leading the way. And mm. then on the other hand, we, we also have Mamarafa College. Mamarafa College is also... One of the it is the leader in terms of indigenous um, mm. education in, in, a, in a religious setting. Mm. There is yes. nothing, no other college that comes close to it. Wow. And you know, and and we're facing huge challenges with that sim because of Mamarafa, because of the growth of our work. And so you know, at sim's moving along. If you put it in a layman's term, it's like a car. Anyway, we set up Mamarafa. It's like putting turbo on the car. We can't keep up with the thing. And so, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, mm. it's just accelerated our, our, our work out of, and in regions where we can't keep up with it. And that mm. poses a challenge for us as a church. Um, but so we, we should be proud of, we should be proud of absolutely. the Atsim work as an Adventist church in this country. Absolutely. We, we have really got... Uh, 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 and in you know, an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander work that, that we ought to be proud of. It is something that we can go out into our communities and tell other people that mm. we are you know, leading the way when it comes to ministering to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Mm. Mm. I remember recently, or maybe when I say recently, maybe within the last six months, doing an interview with Pastor Don Felberg, who's very active in, I believe, that space. Mm. And he was telling me, Yes. How amazing it is, you know, working in these very remote communities of Aboriginal people and how receptive they are to the gospel. And I, I remember leaving that interview just feeling so inspired, like, oh, you know, I want to go on mission trips to these places and see it in action. So, yeah, yeah props to you guys. You're doing amazing work. <laughs> and, and that's happening all over the place. Like, even just um, early this year, March this year, uh, just towards the end of March, was my second visit to a community. It's the second time I've been there, but I'm the only Adventist who's been to that community. Mm -hmm. And I was able to run programs there. Mm -hmm. So that's a community that we have not entered into. And yet we've got communities like that saying, can you come and visit us? Can you come and, and, and run meetings in our community? We've got those requests coming to us from different places. Mm -hmm. um, we don't hear of that happening in, in a lot of other churches too much. Yeah. But with the Adventist message, they want to hear our message. And we've got a very powerful message. Mm -hmm. And yes. we've got a message that, that uh, not only, you know, it turns people to Jesus, but it turns their life around. Mm -hmm. It turns their communities around, their families. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's so special about it. We notice that with, with the students that are coming in to Mamarafa to study, they come in as individuals, they go home, they minister to their families, and they minister to their communities, their communities become better places. And so everybody, um, yeah, is affected by it. Just before we finish, guys, if we could um, ask, I guess, the spiritual question, the important question that comes back to our faith as individuals. Why, as Christians, do we need to do something about racism? Why is this so... Um, against what it means to be a Christian, to sit by and either do nothing or to be part of the systems that are 
enforcing and pushing out discrimination. What what are we called to do as Christians? In, in if you guys could just leave us with that thought um, in, in that space, why is it so important that we join these conversations? That we advocate for people in 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 closing the gap, in in, in lifting up brothers and sisters who perhaps aren't as um, privileged as we are. Um, why is it that this is an imperative for us as Christians rather than something we can just ignore and, and focus on preaching the gospel, you know, and, and ignore some of these issues. I, I think firstly, we have a history churches in Australia have a history of working with Aboriginal people, Torres Strait Islander people, not only working with them with the missions, but also have become perpetrators of wrong as well. Mm. There's a history of that. And we, 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 um, we must acknowledge that as Christians, sure, the government had put in place policies. The police implemented those policies, but it was the church or the churches as well that carried out and became the places uh, mm. for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be brought together. It was the churches. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we, we've got a lot, lot of work to do to, 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 to fix things up, so to speak. And, and we have an obligation to minister Jesus to the people. They may not have got that mm -hmm. way back then, but mm -hmm. we have an opportunity today and we have an obligation to set that that picture straight for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, secondly, I'll just say, Terry, uh, there's many instances in the Bible and examples just of Jesus alone, his own ministry. Mm -hmm. The woman at the well, um, beautiful story. And, and it's about crossing the boundaries, crossing those lines of different races, different, um, you know, norms and expectations. Mm -hmm. Jesus did that as an example for us. He gives us parables in the Bible that help to illustrate what we can do and what we should value as well. Um, and then finally, I'll just finish Jesus' prayer, John 17. He prays for the unity of the believers and the reason why he prays for the unity of the believers is so that they could be a greater witness. We will not become a greater witness if we're not unified. Mm. If we have racial tensions, if we, if we can't get on in this world, um, mm. how do we expect it to witness to and show the love of Jesus to somebody else? Mm. So very simple, but yet very powerful message, isn't it? that we have in the Bible. Mm. Yeah. And I think that um, if basically I think that it has the potential to um, to be a barrack, well, to railroad the work of the three angels message. Mm -hmm. You, 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 we have, we've, we've, um, how on earth do we really represent Christ's love? Um, I know I've heard so many stories of, of, of family and friends who've been in missions and some people really showed the love of God and for them, they, they said they were champions and they they could see the love of Jesus. And others, it was more about um, teaching a different culture, the right way of, you know, the so-called right way of doing things and the right way of being and you're doing things the wrong way. And it did mm. not represent Jesus. And so mm -hmm. one is a false gospel and the other is the true gospel. Yes. And, and that true gospel is that, while Christ has, you know, we can proudly be who, you know, whoever 
we want to be. Moses was reminded that he was a Hebrew. He'd been grown up as, 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 a, as an Egyptian, but he was reminded that he was a, an Israelite. He was a, an Israelite man. Well, it wasn't, uh, they weren't Israel then, but he was reminded who he was and that, and that he would set his people free. Mm. Well, God was going to use him. Um, and so we can be proud of our cultures without trying to, to change or oppress one another. No, it is about um, coming together under that umbrella of the unity that, that, God, that Darren is talking about, of God is love. And, um, and being inclusive of our cultural differences. Mm. Yeah, as brothers and, and sisters. And, and, and you mentioned the three angels message um, there, Terry. I've just pulled that up here. It says that the eternal good news was to be proclaimed to the people who belong to this world, every nation, tribe, language, and people. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, yes. And, 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 and yet often in the past, I think the church has been, or the Christendom has been responsible for saying, you have to leave your culture at the door. You have to check your, your, your identity, your nationhood. And you, you, you forget about that. And you just become sort of a homogenous white yeah. Eurocentric church. And yet um, I think from what we've learned today, we can see that it's, it, there's beauty and there's value in being unified and being proud of our culture. Yeah. Um, being proud of knowing who who we are and our identity in Christ, but at the yeah. same time, uh, understanding that 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 message goes to all of our cultures and all of our tribes and our nations, and, and we need to we need to be aiming for that 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 heavenly place, that 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 true eternal gospel that that we have, um, that message that we have. Guys, uh, I've been. Um, I hope you've enjoyed joining us, Terry and Darren. Today, we I've been really blessed by this conversation, by the the humility and the the willingness to share some of your experiences that you guys have shared with us. Um, I know it mustn't have been easy necessarily to come on and talk about some of these heavy type issues. Um, so we just want to say from from Adventist Record and for all those who are going to view this this video, this interview. Um, thank you. Very big. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in your spaces to be advocates for your people. Thank you for being willing to come and talk to us and, and educate us and to help us to listen and to learn more about um, what you guys have, have experienced. Um, it's, it's, it's immensely appreciated from myself and I'm sure there's a lot of people that are going to be sitting watching this or, or on the train or, or however they're, consuming this content they're going to be like this is this is a really valuable conversation so thank you for joining us and, and for giving us your precious time Darren, and Darren can I say one more thing I want to acknowledge and um, um, I'm sure Darren exactly the same all those allies all of all of those amazing non-indigenous allies who have sacrificed so much along with us in in this work mm. who have supported us through thick and thin you know your names you know uh, you know some have 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 um passed on um i don't want to uh, to name people only because i don't want to leave people out yes but um but you know we've had we've had a people at the top people all through who have just pulled alongside us mm. and and been there for us and we are looking for many more now, i'm mm -hmm. optimistic about this and it's um darren yeah uh, uh, it, it, it's really um, that's it's terry that's the way to that we ought to work together and um is really to have these conversations mm -hmm. talk about yeah. things uh, we're all in the same work. We're all we're all doing God's ministry, and mm. we just want to be witnesses for for the kingdom of God. That's that's what we're aiming for. This world isn't our own. It's not the best place. I mean, 
<laughs> as much as all the beauty that we have in Australia, and it is the best country in the world, we look forward <laughs> to heaven. And, um, yes. you know, and uh, that's, 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 that's a life for us. But in the meantime, we have a ministry to do. And it's everybody's ministry. It's a mm. ministry that Jesus has called us to do. And, and, you know, as long as we get alongside of each other and work towards that, have an understanding of each other. We're all different. That's great. Mm. And uh, let's appreciate that mm. because that's what, that's what gives us that richness as well. Yeah. Thank, thank you again for your willingness. Pastor Darren, if you don't mind um, saying a prayer for us, for the ATSIM work, for our, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country, those who are struggling at the moment with all the things that are going on in the world, um, and for, for those who are watching this, that they get out of it what the Holy Spirit needs them to hear to, to, to make moves in their own life to address those areas where perhaps there isn't as much light as there needs to be. Um, would you mind, Pastor Darren? Sure. Thank you. It's about it. Yes. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the opportunity to have a conversation today. Lord, to just learn and to hear from one another. We know that uh, through this process, in our Aboriginal context, we call this just yarning. Yarning together getting to know one another. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity. We, we're so grateful for our church, for the leaders of our church, the ministry that our church is doing, and for all our church members that are all over this country, scattered in some very remote places, but the country towns and the big cities. And we just thank you for each one. And we thank you for their commitment. We thank you that... As a church, Lord, we're, we're willing to learn. We're willing to work together. We're willing to, to understand and uh, come together in humility to, to, to be one. And so, Lord, we just thank you for, for all these things. We pray special prayer for, for ATSIM, for this department of our church that is leading the way in this country and ministering to Indigenous people right across the nation. We pray that uh, you will bless the workers that are on the ground. We think of some of the remote uh, workers that we have in, in parts of the Northern Territory in Western Australia and uh, South Australia. And we ask that uh, you'll just watch over them. We think of our, our guys up in the Torres Strait as well. Uh, our pastor up there who's, who's ministering in, in, in uh, an area that uh, is challenging, but also very rewarding. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we've got a lot of ministry ha activity happening all around in our big cities. And so we give you thanks for that today. Thank you for our church leaders who support and our committees who, who back the work. Lord, we, um, we just, we're just humbled and uh, appreciative of your spirit that uh, allows us to talk and, and to come to the table together like this. And so, Lord, we just, um, yeah, we just pray for all of our members, our Aboriginal people uh, that we're working with, those that have been imp impacted by the stolen generation, by churches, by missions, and, and, and even today, the, 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 the politics of, of everything that goes on. As uh, we navigate through that, Lord, may you bless this ministry. Mm -hmm. And we continue to, to, to bless our church. We think about Mamarafa College and the, the, the wonderful ministry that they do there, the staff and uh, all the students that come from different places. We ask that you'll keep your hand over Mamarafa. And Lord, for our church members, we know that this is, this is God's work, but it's not just Adsim's work. It's all of us. We're all in this together. And we just pray that uh, for our non-Aboriginal uh, supporters in the communities, in our churches, and for those that haven't stepped forward yet, we pray that uh, there'll be a willingness, a spirit of willingness to step up and to say, hey, brother, hey, sister, what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. And so we thank you for these opportunities, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.